It is good to be with you tonight, and I am really looking forward to being together with all of you at one time in the same place this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30. Hopefully most of us have heard by now that we are finally getting back to one service. We'll be meeting for class at 9.30 this coming Sunday morning. And then for worship at 10.30, we no longer need to sign up ahead of time, so I'm very thankful to the, uh, for that. Just one less thing to do, one less thing to remember, one, uh, one less barrier b between us and getting together. And so we do hope to see you this coming Sunday. As most of us also know, the City County Health Department has also lifted the mask mandate in Dane County, so wearing masks is back to being a matter of personal preference. So uh, whatever your choice is on that, we uh, certainly are looking forward to being back together this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30. Uh, today we are continuing on in our brief series of lessons on prophecy in the Bible. We're hitting the highlights, we're doing an overview, and to help keep us on track, to give us some sense of direction and progress, we are putting a very rough outline of this on the side of the screen, on the left-hand side there, starting with the basics. A definition of prophecy, some principles of prophecy, and then moving on to some examples of various prophecies concerning nations, individuals, God's kingdom, and then ending with some prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus himself. Several weeks ago, you may remember, we started by describing a prophet as someone who is basically a spokesperson, just as Aaron was a prophet or a spokesperson for Moses. The word as it is used there, it is not necessarily a religious word. I know today we hear the word prophet, obviously we think in terms of religion. But again, it just meant a, a spokesperson, somebody who speaks on behalf of another. And then we also noted there that the word seer and the word prophet were sometimes used interchangeably in the Old Testament. A seer is someone who sees, usually referring to somebody who sees the future. A prophet is someone who speaks on God's behalf. And so uh, prophecy might involve foretelling the future, but it might not. The prophet might just have a, a message from God to pass along that may not involve predicting what's to come. We then looked at that chart listing all of the prophets in the Bible, at least to the best of my ability. I hope you'll look that over again, send me any updates or corrections, anything that I missed there. Uh, but personally, I was surprised by the number of prophets, but this is available on our website if you want to explore this further. That's another good tool that we might use in a study like this. Uh, in our study, we've been focusing on predictive prophecy. So we're focusing in on one little part of uh, the prophetic work, and that is speaking not just on God's behalf, but more specifically, we are looking in this series at the kind of speaking on God's behalf where a prophet does foretell the future in some way. And for this, we started by establishing some principles of prophecy. By way of very brief review as to the timing of the prophecy, there has to be some distance between the prophecy and the fulfillment. So this is more than just an educated guess. This is, uh, there is some separation there. As to the details, it has to be specific. So this isn't some, a great leader will arise in the future kind of prediction. That's not, uh, that's not specific enough. So it has to be specific. As to the fulfillment, it cannot be something that the prophet can affect. And we use the illustration of, I predict this pen will fall to the ground. And if it does, that, that doesn't predict, or that doesn't say I'm a prophet at all. Uh, that's kind of ridiculous. So there has to be uh, some separation between my control of this prediction that I'm making and the prediction itself. Uh, as to the accuracy, there can be no mistakes. In fact, in the Old Testament, the penalty was death for somebody who spoke something that was inaccurate like that. And I'm very thankful that uh, that uh, God allows some uh, mercy today for, for honest mistakes. But anyway, we added one more, uh, something of a reminder, and that is prophecy itself is temporary. And for this, we noted that passage in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, where Paul says that love is permanent, but the miraculous spiritual gifts like prophecy, they are temporary. So that time has come and gone. We no longer have miraculous predictive prophecy in the world today. Uh, last week, we started looking at some examples of predictive prophecy, starting with some national prophecy. So that was our category last week. We started with one prophecy concerning Egypt. We looked at one concerning Rome, but we spent most of our class last week looking at some prophecies concerning Babylon and specifically the Babylonian captivity and then the aftermath of that captivity. By the way, one of our Christian sisters had an especially sharp eye last week, and I am very thankful for that. She noticed that the reference to the passage in Isaiah 44 was miscited as being in Isaiah chapter 27. So thank you very much for catching that. Uh, somebody was paying attention. You know, that's, that's an awesome thing. Uh, I do... 
Uh, I'm a little bit sad that I made my only mistake of 2022 so early in the year. I mean, it was only February, and, and here we are. I've already I've already gotten that one out of the way. Uh, there were a couple other little um, miss citations last week. You might have noticed this was the the most significant though, completely wrong chapter, not just like a verse here and there that was or wasn't included. But anyway, this one is Isaiah 44, 27, and 28. And the prophecy part of this, in case you were distracted by all that, uh, is just with reference to Babylon. The conquest of Babylon involved the drying up of water. So that was a unique way to capture an ancient city. But you may, may remember they diverted the river around it, went in under uh, the, the old riverbed. But even more importantly in this passage, we have the name Cyrus, which is given many years before Cyrus was even born. So that was the, uh, the main point of that passage. Um, tonight we move on from the national prophecies, and tonight we'll be looking at some examples of prophecies concerning individuals, so some personal prophecies. And th this isn't really a, a solid and distinct category. There's a lot of variety here. Uh, but these are some of those prophecies that really don't fit in the other categories. So they're they're not really national prophecies. They're they're not prophecies about the kingdom or the church. They're not prophecies about the Lord directly. Uh, this is almost like a miscellaneous category. The, these are the others. So tonight is everything else. This is the variety pack of prophecy tonight. And there might be some overlap here and there. And I, there will be. And we'll keep an eye out for that as we progress. But these are kind of the, the miscellaneous category. Mis, uh, personal or individual prophecies. And I'll try to hit some of these in very roughly the order in which they're found in the Bible. And really the only reason I do that is to make it easier for us if we're looking for these passages. But when I think of predictive prophecies that are not about nations, the church, or Jesus, I think about God's prediction that Abraham would have a son in his old age. Remember, that's one of those early prophecies that was made. And this first passage is from Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. One of the earliest references to Abram, later known as Abraham. Notice what the text says. This is Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So I think we see how this overlaps with some of the other categories. Do we see that there? I mean, in a sense, this is a prophecy about a nation. But it's not a prophecy that was given to a nation. Abraham wasn't a nation at this point. Abram was just some guy. Uh, he was faithful to God. He kept God's laws. We'll find that in, in other passages. Um, but it's not really about a nation. It, it's a prophecy that will lead to a nation being formed. Uh, but that's really not what this prophecy is about specifically. It's also kind of, in a way, a prophecy about the Messiah, isn't it? That nations or people will be blessed through you kind of thing. Uh, but I'm just focusing on this tonight as a personal prophecy concerning the birth of Isaac. So Isaac is an individual. Abraham is an individual. So we've got some individuals involved here. Abraham, or Abram, I think is about 75 years old at this point. Uh, his wife is about 10 years younger, so around 65. But God predicts in this passage that Abram will become a great nation. So th this is the first clue that Abram will have a son, as God predicts that he would make his name great. So I think if we talk to a man about his name becoming great in the future, most of us could probably assume that there would be some children involved here. So it's just touching on it at this point. We'll get more specific in the coming passages. So we'll pick up a few chapters later if we turn over to Genesis 15, 1 through 5. This is Genesis 15, 1 through 5. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So here, very specifically, God predicts that Abram would have a son of his own. 
And not only would he have a son of his own, but his descendants would multiply even to the point where God tells Abram that his descendants would be compared to the number of stars in the heavens. Uh, however, in Genesis 16, Abram sees this as such an impossibility, even after the reminder and the renewal of this promise from God. Uh, he has a son, Ishmael, with his wife's servant, Hagar. And I know this isn't Isaac, but some have seen this uh, prophecy as a prophecy, even in the birth of Ishmael. And uh, Sarah runs Hagar out of town. She's very jealous. We can understand what's going through her mind. So she, she runs this servant, mistress, we might say, out in, into the wild. And an angel speaks some very comforting words to Hagar, including what's on your screen here. This is Genesis 16, verses 11 and 12. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. So notice we have something of a prophecy concerning Ishmael, don't we? And we don't have too many details about how this actually plays out long term. Uh, Ishmael kind of trails off and we don't follow his history through the Bible like we do uh, the descendants of Abraham through Isaac. Uh, but we do know that our Islamic friends consider Ishmael to be an ancestor to Muhammad. And if this is true, I think we do see what is said here as perhaps being fulfilled, uh, not just in the life of Ishmael directly, but really in an ongoing basis through Ishmael's descendants. There would be this conflict ongoing between the descendants of Isaac, the Jews, and the descendants of Ishmael, that is, our Islamic friends, if we look at it in that way. And I, of course, I say this very cautiously, though, since the information is rather limited. That's not the point of these chapters. Uh, but I thought we should at least mention it since we are talking about these prophecies that have been made concerning Isaac. So we then come to Genesis chapter 17. And in Genesis chapter 17, God makes the prediction concerning Isaac yet again. So it's like uh, at least the third reminder here. Uh, this is Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk beside me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer will your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and to your descendants after you, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And then God goes on, he creates circumcision as a sign of this covenant. And so we skip over a few verses and let's continue and pick up with uh, Genesis 17 verses 15 through 22. Genesis 17, 15 through 22. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will establish. I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. So God once again predicts that Abraham will bear a son, or that uh, 
specifically, Sarah would bear a son to Abraham. And uh, the Lord specifically says that Ishmael is not the son. So this is Ishmael is not the fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, the Lord also says that the child would be named Isaac. So a specific name is given. And this is where we learn Abraham is about 100 years old. Sarah is about 90 at this point. Um, all of this then continues into the next chapter. So let's continue on forward looking at this. This is one of the big prophecies, really, of the Old Testament. So this is uh, Genesis 18, 1 through 15. Now the Lord appeared to him by the yokes of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day, when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, There in the tent. He said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Well, I hesitated to read the whole passage here, but uh, I, I think we did read it together, first of all, because verse 8 uh, contains the first reference to cheese curds in the Bible. So uh, this, therefore, it is an extremely important passage for those of us here in Wisconsin. So uh, curds in the Bible, we could probably do an entire study just on that. Uh, but secondly, I wanted to uh, at least read down through verse 15, where these messengers specifically confront Sarah for laughing. And this is how ridiculous this prophecy is. At the age of 90, uh, Sarah knows without a doubt there is no possible way for her to bear a son. She knows that she is beyond her childbearing years, and, and it's just not possible. And uh, so much so that it is literally laughable, isn't it? And there's that little confrontation, and I think she's kind of uh, throwing some shade at her husband, <laughs> too. Um, you know, he's, he's 100. I don't, I don't know if I'm in the, the pleasure time of life here with my hubby. And uh, we're kind of both beyond this. And that's kind of the way I would look at that. But anyway, we have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, right after this. And these messengers go on over there. But we uh, pick up briefly with Genesis 21, verses 1 through 8. Genesis 21, verses 1 through 8. Then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. So what a neat passage that is. I, I love how Sarah herself, bring, she brings up the laughter, doesn't she? She's probably kind of embarrassed about how that went down uh, the previous year. 
Um, but anyway, she, she brings this up. Uh, who would have thought that, uh, that Sarah would, would nurse children? And there's so much we can note on all of this, but I think our focus is on the birth of Isaac being the fulfillment of prophecy. And we'll get back to this with the prophecies concerning Jesus and touch on this in a couple weeks. But I think that as we've studied, have we seen some similarities between the birth of Isaac and the birth of Jesus? Uh, both were prophesied, that is, they were predicted beforehand. Not all births are predicted like that. Uh, both had a specific timeline. Uh, both mothers questioned the possibility of what was about to happen. Uh, both mothers were told about the power of God and were given that reminder. Uh, both children were named beforehand by God. Both situations were considered to be miraculous, obviously in different ways. Not a perfect parallel there by any means, but there are some similarities. And while we're on prophetic birth announcements, I also want to at least uh, specifically mention a few others including Samson, Samuel, and John, that is John the Immerser, or John the Baptist, as he's sometimes known. And again, they're not perfectly parallel with Isaac or with one another, but they are similar in some way. So we have women who are not capable of bearing children. There is some kind of prediction made or some kind of interaction with God or an angel of some kind. And then the women do give birth just as predicted. And there may be others that I've missed, but to me, uh, these fit into the same category as the prophecies made concerning Isaac. Uh, switching gears here, but still keeping with the category of personal prophecies, we, we also want to consider several prophecies made by Joseph. Uh, these prophecies, in fact, had a way of getting him in trouble and later out of trouble. So this first passage is Genesis 37 verses 1 through 11. Genesis 37, 1 through 11. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic, okay? A coat of many colors. I'm just adding that in here. That's how we understand that, a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, please listen to this dream which I've had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf stood up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? or do you re Are you really going to rule over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now we had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. <laughs> He related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Well, so much we could discuss here. We're going to get to this in a few months as we study through Genesis. Um, you know, I guess practical lessons, if you have dreams, you don't have to tell every dream that you have. It's not always wise to share absolutely everything, especially with your brothers. Uh, but I would take these dreams as prophecies. He's making a prediction here, isn't he? Um, are these dreams fulfilled? Absolutely they are. In the verses that come after this, his brothers get more and more angry to the point where they beat him up, uh, sell him into slavery. Uh, Joseph then ends up in Egypt where we have another round of what I would des uh, what I would describe as prophecies. Uh, due to our limited time tonight, I won't even read these, but in Genesis 40, as he's in prison, uh, Joseph actually interprets the dreams of Pharaoh's baker and cupbearer, uh, accurately predicting what would happen. The baker's executed. Remember the birds were eating the bread out of the basket on the guy's head in a dream and all that. Uh, the cupbearer is then restored to his position of honor. So one way and then the other. Uh, the cupbearer forgets about Joseph for a while, of course. It eventually leads to Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dream in Genesis 41. The fat cows, the skinny cows, all that kind of thing. And then and Joseph predicts a famine. Pharaoh puts him in charge of preparing for the famine. And then once that famine comes, that leads to Joseph's brothers actually making their way to Egypt, begging for food and fulfilling um, those dreams from many, many years earlier. Uh, just a few chapters later... 
And still keeping with the category of personal prophecies, we could also consider the blessings that Jacob gave to his sons shortly before he dies. This is in Genesis chapter 49. And we'll just start with Genesis 49 verses 1 and 2. Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Okay, does that sound like prophecy? I'm going to tell you what will happen. So absolutely, this is my words just adding in here. This, this is definitely prophecy. He says, Gather together, in verse 2, and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. It was the custom in those days for a father to give blessings to his children. And um, so this seems to be somewhat prophetic, doesn't it? So it's not just a blessing, but this is, these are blessings that are predicting the future. And uh, we aren't specifically told they're prophecies, but uh, they are absolutely uh, prophecies. And we're going to see that they are a absolutely accurate as well. So we've got a whole chapter of these almost. He goes through all the, all the children here. But I want to share just the first few uh, by way of a kind of a, a sample, giving just a little example here since our time is limited. So Genesis 49, we'll just look at verses 3 through 10. Reuben you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers, their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel, let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes." and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Well, this obviously continues for a number of more verses, but I think we're starting to see how this entire passage is at least somewhat prophetic. And obviously, these last few words concerning Judah are definitely a prophecy involving Jesus. But hopefully, we'll get back to that in another lesson. But for now, we've at least touched on this idea of a father making some prophecies concerning his children before he dies. And this happens back in the patriarchal age when God often communicated things directly through the heads of households, which he's obviously doing here. Um, in the miscellaneous personal prophecy category, we also have an interesting prediction concerning the rebuilding of Jericho. And I'll just throw this one in here as one of the more famous prophecies. Uh, Jericho's destroyed. Remember the marching around the city and all that? That's under the leadership of Joshua, Joshua 6. And toward the end of that chapter, Joshua makes a prediction so, like, they're gathered around the smoking rubble, and uh, Joshua then made them take an oath at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. With the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation, and with the loss of his youngest son, he shall set up its gates. Well, we might wonder, um, how is this a prophecy about a city? How is it considered personal? Uh, well, it's personal if you're the guy who rebuilds the city. Does that make sense? Then it's you. This involves somebody. And so we fast forward several hundred years to the rule of King Ahab. This is way forward, jumping forward a few centuries. This is 1 Kings 16, 33 and 34. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hiel the Bethelite built Jericho. He laid its foundations with the loss of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. That's amazing. So the curse of Joshua, this prediction made way back when it comes true, it is fulfilled several hundred years later. And we might wonder at this point, in light of what Joshua had predicted, why would these men dare risk rebuilding Jericho? Well, I can think of at least two possibilities. Number one, under the rule of King Ahab, Bible knowledge is so sparse, they had no idea Joshua had ever said that. Do you see how that's a possibility? They don't care about the Word of God. They, they don't care about what Joshua said. This isn't a thing for them. So they, they might not have even known this. 
But then secondly, the possibility is they knew what Joshua had said, but they didn't believe it or they didn't care. And I, you know, I don't know which one it is or if there's some other situation here. I would think that if one kid died, somebody would kind of look into that and maybe he wouldn't have continued, but apparently he did. And this, this is what happened. But um, either way, this man paid for it with the, uh, with the lives of his children. Uh, there are a number of other prophecies we could consider tonight from the Old Testament, several of these being found in the books of Kings and Chronicles. That was like a, a hot time for prophecy. We could spend hours looking at those books. But our time is short, so let's hit just a few here at the end. Let's look at the New Testament. Obviously, we just finished looking at the book of Acts, and so hopefully we remember something about Agabus, kind of a weird name, very memorable. Uh, Agabus is found twice in the book of Acts, starting in Acts 11, where he's found in Antioch. Right after that verse where we find the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, we come to Acts 11, verses 27 through 30. Acts 11, 27 through 30, where Luke says this, Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So Agabus then, by inspiration, as a prophet, he predicts this coming famine. And there is, in fact, a terrible famine. We have this confirmed in secular history. And this, they, they bring help, they donate. And uh, this leads Paul to continue. He travels around, picking up relief from a number of Gentile congregations in Macedonia to bring back to Judea. All of that started with a predictive prophecy from Agabus. Well, the second reference to Agabus is several years later, uh, skipping forward to Acts 21, 10 through 14, as Paul is making his way back to Jerusalem on his third missionary journey, I believe, he comes to Caesarea and Agabus shows up. And this is Acts 21, 10 through 14. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. So again, Agabus speaks up with a, another prediction here. This time he warns Paul, if you continue on to Jerusalem, it will not end well. And Paul, of course, ignores that warning. And uh, he is indeed taken into custody in Jerusalem and is handed over to the Romans. And so this is the second fulfilled prophecy from the prophet Agabus. So tonight then, we've looked at several examples of some personal prophecies being made and fulfilled. To uh, Abraham, concerning the book of uh, birth of Isaac, we just noted some similarities between those and the predictions made concerning the births of Samson, Samuel, and John. We then looked at Joseph's dreams and his interpretations of several other dreams, all involving prophecy. We looked at Jacob blessing his children. We looked at the fall of Jericho, the prophecy made against whoever may someday decide to rebuild it. And then we close tonight with two prophecies from Agabus. So I think you will agree that is the prophecy variety pack. So we've a lot of, a lot of different prophecies here, different people, different testaments, different time periods. Uh, but hopefully this has been beneficial in some way. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing you this coming Sunday, Lord's Day morning, 9.30 a.m. as we continue looking at 1 Timothy. Um, I, I hope you were there this past Sunday. Our discussion of 1 Timothy 2 this past Lord's Day morning, it was one of the best, one of the most uh, positive discussions that I think I've ever been a part of in a Bible class. And uh, we're thankful to John for his leadership in that class. I hope you can join us this coming Sunday again, if you can. Bible study at 930, and then all of us together for worship again at 1030. Uh, as we come to the end of tonight's study, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us these prophecies that we've studied tonight. We're thankful for your servants, the prophets, for their courage and boldness in speaking up, even when it was not popular. 
especially when they had messages that were very difficult to deliver. Give us their courage. Tonight we pray for peace. We pray that you would make us instruments of your peace, that we would bring peace into our families, into our relationships, and that we would bring your peace into the lives of everybody around us. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior and King. Amen.